Have you ever felt like life was really unfair? I know that uh, in a household full of children like mine, that is often the allegation of my young children against either my wife or myself. This idea that we're treating one of the other children with greater generosity or they, they get away with more and, and we have less tolerance with one child than the other. It's unfair. You always do. Have you ever heard those kinds of sentences? Well, if you have, then you will relate to the story that Jesus told and the outrage that it caused. It's found in Matthew chapter 20 from verses 1 and onwards. And it's the story of a group of laborers who are hired by a landowner to go into their field uh, and to work. And so as the story goes, the laborer goes to the marketplace. He finds this group of men standing around waiting for daily employees. He says, I'm going to hire you for one denarius, which was the average day's wage. And I'm going to pay you this one denarius. And what I want you to do is I want you to go into my vineyard. I want you to tend it. I want you to take care of it. I want you to do the pruning, whatever it is that you do in a vineyard to make the vineyard in good condition for a great harvest. And so these men, men agree. And so early in the morning, they head off to the landowner's field and there they go and do their work. Later on, the, the landowner decides he needs more employees, more workers. And so he goes back uh, quite late in the day to fetch a few more workers. And he says to them, look, I want you to come work in my vineyard. This time he doesn't promise them anything. They simply agree to trust themselves. I mean, it is late in the day, right? They'll simply trust themselves to the landowner that he will give them whatever he deems is appropriate. And so they agree to this. Off they go. No questions asked. Just grateful to be employed. Grateful for the opportunity to work. And so they go into the vineyard. Come the end of the day. Come the end of the day. It's time to hand out the wage, right? And so Jesus gathers all these workers around and he starts with those who came late in the day and he gives them a denarius. That's the same amount he promised to give to the guys who came early in the day. He gets to the first group, he gives them also a denarius and then there's this outrage. Then there is this it's unfair line that comes through in the story. How is it, Mr. Landowner, that you have given us who have worked the whole day for you a certain wage which you've decided to give to exactly in exactly the same amount to the people who only arrived here an hour or two ago? To which the landowner replies in the following sentences. He says in Matthew 20 from verse 13, He answered and said to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. But I wish to give to this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what, what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? Thus the last shall be first and the first shall be last. This is, uh, this is one of those, I mean, I don't know, if you read this parable and if you understand this story, there is something, I'll be honest with you, there is something within me that feels like this is a little bit unfair. I mean, wouldn't you agree? Uh, if you were the person who had been there through the heat of the day, through the dehydration of the day, through the hunger of the day, through the hard work of the day, and then these other fellows show up and they get the same wage, hey, I almost think... <laughs> I almost think that in this day and age with the labor laws we have, you could almost lay a complaint against the employer for, for unjust or unfair treatment or payment. Nevertheless, as this parable goes, Jesus is actually not concerned with daily employment. He's taking an object lesson to illustrate a spiritual reality. Now, a number of years ago, I had this interesting experience. Similar sort of a thing, but in a, in a different realm. A friend of mine and myself, we ended up studying together, right? We were study buddies. And uh, as we engaged in our studies, um, there were a number of assignments. There were a number of exams, as there is a heap of reading. And we were doing the same courses at the same time as one another. And so the way it worked out, uh, for, fortunately in my favor, uh, from my perspective, is that whenever there were assignments, I was able to knock out those assignments in probably an hour or two or at least a fraction of the time that it took the other friend of mine to, to do their assignments. Sometimes it would take them hours or even days and I would be under the pump, I would be under pressure, I would have work deadlines and study deadlines and so uh, I was always rushing at things and so I would, I would come into these things sometimes late, high pressure situation, but I would get it knocked out and then when the results came back, much to the 
much to the um, chagrin of my study buddy, when we got our results, we would get the same marks, or at times I would even score a little higher than this individual, and it would drive them nuts. It's unfair, right? It's this idea that I've put in more work than you, how is it that you get the same or similar result to me? And I don't know if you've been through something like that in the study environment or maybe in the work environment. There, there is a way in which we, we look at the story and we think, wow, there is something a little unfair about this. Now, let me just say to you, the story is actually about grace, right? It's actually about the kingdom of God. In fact, there are a few other places in the Bible, Old Testament and in the New Testament, where the vineyard represents the kingdom of God. God owns a vineyard and he, uh, he sends people out into the field to take care of the vineyard. In fact, one of the parables that Jesus taught uh, in, in John chapter 15 was this idea that he is the vine, right? He is the vine and we are the branches. So vineyards and vines and so on tend to represent the kingdom of God. And so as the story goes here, uh, these people are gone out to take care of the kingdom of God. These are employees in the service of the God of heaven. And as they go out to do this work, the story ends up in a place where all end up being paid the same wage. I think at its core, what Jesus is trying to say here is simply that when we come to him and we receive salvation, when we become citizens and heirs in the kingdom of God, number one, everyone who receives the invitation of Christ and accepts the invitation of Christ is born into the kingdom as a missionary. No one is born into the kingdom of God to put their feet up and say, thank God I'm saved now. I'm just going to sit here and wait in indolence and laziness until the glory of Jesus comes with the second coming and then we'll go home to eternal paradise and eternal holiday. The idea here is that all those who respond to the invitation of the vineyard owner are sent into the vineyard to tend and take care of it. We, are, we become co-workers and partners with Jesus. The second idea that comes out here is that we all agree essentially to the same thing when we accept Christ. We agree to receive His presence, to be co-workers with Him, and He promises us eternal life. It's the same end result for everybody, whether you have accepted Christ early in your life or whether you've accepted Christ late in your life. And this is where the cry of foul comes up, because let's think about this. So what you're saying is that if I accept Jesus when I'm older, I get to have the same eternal life that someone who accepted Jesus later in life gets, right? So the logic might be, well, hey, wait a second, maybe I should put off accepting Jesus. Maybe I should wait until I'm later in life. I'll live the good worldly life, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll party and live out the pleasures of sin and, and have the best of this world. And then later on, Later on, I'll accept Jesus Christ, and my reward, as it were, eternal life, will be the same as if I accepted Him when I was 20 and had to live a life of self-denial for much longer than the other person who accepts Jesus later in their experience. Well, I think the problem with that idea is that it betrays the fact that maybe we're pursuing Jesus not because we want Jesus, not because we are enamored, impressed, in love with the character of our God, but because we want the side benefit of salvation. Now, I use the word side benefit because often we put that front and center. Why should I accept Jesus Christ? Well, because you don't want to die for eternity. You want to live for eternity. And, and the way you get that eternal life is you accept Jesus. That makes Jesus simply a means to an end, right? So if you think about this, if we say that in order to have eternal life, you must accept Jesus, it makes eternal life the goal and Jesus simply the road to get there. Now, Jesus is the road to get there. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life, right? So when you go with Jesus, you are on the way to eternal life. But I often think to myself sometimes that it's like we are, we are selling eternal life instead of selling Jesus. Now, the difference here is... I might ask it to you like this. Have you ever been in a friendship with someone only to find out they weren't that interested in you? They were only interested in your stuff. They were only interested in the benefits of knowing you. The, perhaps, perhaps 
you boosted their reputation in the eyes of others, or perhaps you had financial wealth that they could access, or some, some other benefit to them, and when you no longer served that benefit to them, they ghosted you. You disappeared off their radar, right? You were no longer a friend to them because actually what they wanted wasn't you. What they wanted was those things that come through association with you. In other words, have you ever been used? And I think when we, when we talk about the kingdom of God, when we talk about salvation, it's important that we it's important that we keep in mind that Jesus isn't offering himself to be used for some purpose of eternal life. You will receive eternal life when you receive Jesus because the whole goal that God has always had is for eternal unbroken relationship, friendship and fellowship with you. That's why he has to give you eternal life because he doesn't want the relationship with you to end. Do you see how we've switched those things around? Human beings with our carnal hearts who are constantly grasping and seeking for personal benefit, we, we get them the wrong way around. We think we must receive Jesus to have eternal life. And we don't realize that actually God is asking or offering to give you eternal life, not, as it, not because eternal life is the end in itself, but because eternal life is the means to enjoy the presence of God for all of eternity. He gives you eternal life because He wants you and we should receive Jesus, not because we want eternal life, but because we want Jesus. Does that make sense? And when we do, the side benefit of salvation is ours. You see, we're called not to love the gift of eternal life. We're called to love the giver of the gift, Jesus Christ. So, what you've got here in the story is a revelation of hearts that are in it because they want to get something. The reason those first early hirelings are upset that, the, that the, the landowner has been generous enough to pay those who came late the same amount as they were promised in the beginning, even although they agreed to that, they were content with that at the beginning of the day, they're not getting any less than what was agreed. The reason they're upset is because they've got that, that, that human trait within them saying, but it's unfair. Why are they getting more than what I'm getting? Actually, they weren't getting more. They were getting exactly the same thing. It was 100% equal because the kingdom of God is not about merit. The kingdom of God is not about how hard you work that determines your wage. That may be how you literally earn your living down here. You do overtime, you get paid more. You carry more responsibility, you get more financial reward. That's how this world works. But Jesus is contrasting this world with the nature of the kingdom and trying to get it in to the heads of you and me, the people of his day, who are accustomed to this work ethic of you want to get paid, you must work. He's trying to break that down in their minds and help them understand that the kingdom of God is not about merit and it's not about how hard you work. It is about the kindness, the generosity and the grace of God the Father. Because in reality, we know from the rest of scripture that there is no amount of working that can offset our sin. There is no amount of right doing that can earn life. Life is the product of being in fellowship with the source of life, Jesus Christ. And so he offers himself to us, the giver of eternal life offers his own presence, his own person to us, that we might have eternal life. You see, this, the struggle between those who came early into the work and those who came late into the work represents, in the time of Jesus, the Jews and the Gentiles. Jesus is talking to a particular historical situation. He's also talking to our time, and I'll come to that in a moment. But if you put yourselves in the, in the shoes of Jesus and in the shoes of the disciples, in the shoes of the scribes and the Pharisees, this, this message of the gospel was going to go to the Gentiles, that is the non-Jews, the non-Israelites, the rest of the world, everything that's not a Jew, not an Israelite, is classified in the Bible as a Gentile. So if you have no Israelite blood in you, you are amongst the Gentiles. I am amongst the Gentiles. 
And this gospel of the kingdom that was entrusted to the Jews during the Old Testament time, they were supposed to share with the Gentiles. They failed miserably at doing that. And they used their Judaism, their rituals, their rites, their ceremonies, their religion, which was supposed to open the mind of the Gentile to the goodness and the glory of God. They used that as a barrier of superiority. You are not like us. God has given us these gifts. We are better than you. We are the chosen people. We are the exclusive family of God. Instead of seeing themselves as servants of humanity, workers in the vineyard to cultivate it, grow it, and develop it, they saw themselves as entitled to the fruit of the vineyard. And so Jesus speaks to them and says, Number one, you are my employees in the kingdom of God. Number two, why will you be upset that later in the unfolding of the plan of salvation, the Gentiles will be invited into the kingdom of God as equal citizens, not as second rate, not as, not as second tier citizens. There's going to be no caste system in the kingdom of God. The Israelites in the highest caste and then the rest of us in the lower caste. It's this idea that the grace of God is extended to everyone freely, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. But all receive the same gift, the same welcome into the same family, a family of equals under the great king of heaven, the owner of the vineyard. The Jews, they had this prejudice. They had this, they had this worker mentality. They had this meritorious mentality. We, we earn our place in the kingdom of God. We work for the king of the kingdom. And it wouldn't be right that others would be invited into this kingdom and given equal standing when we have this ancient heritage of hundreds of years of, quote, faithfulness to God, of sacrifice for God, of labor for God, of being, of being persecuted for God. It didn't make sense to them. And Jesus is saying to them, no, you have missed, you have missed it entirely. Your privilege was that you were called early. You know, I think Jesus is hinting at something important here. The reward is not only eternal life one day. The reward, in fact, is the everyday journey with God today. It's the idea that we're not only looking for something in the future one day that He's going to give to us, but right now, through the gift of His presence, through fellowship with Him, by being in the vineyard with Him, that is a reward. That is in and of itself a privilege. To, to walk with Jesus, to know Jesus, to, to live in the sunshine of His presence, to, to, to experience His deliverance and His grace and His kindness. Now, think about this. Is that not in itself a glorious reward, let alone the promise of eternity? What these men revealed was that they were nothing more than hirelings. They didn't get the fact that the privilege wasn't only the reward in the end. It was the very experience of being in the vineyard with the vineyard owner. It was the very experience of, of the grace of God on a daily basis. They missed it completely. All they had their eye on was that final reward and in their minds, you got the final reward, not because of the grace and the kindness of the landowner. You got it because you worked for it. So when somebody comes along who, who may accept Jesus late in their life, somebody else comes along who, who hasn't been as quick to receive Jesus as you have, and you look at them with disdain, and you think to yourself, how is it fair that they should inherit the same eternal kingdom as what I do when I have been in this work, when I have sacrificed, when I have toiled, when I have been persecuted? You see, just like the Jews, sometimes we can have that same attitude. And it, it, it's not saying something about that other person. It's actually saying something about our own attitude, our own perception in terms of the kingdom of God, our own awareness or lack thereof of the goodness of the character of God. I think to myself, I deserve more, Lord, because I have given up more. I have sacrificed more. I've been on this journey for longer. Don't you think that I deserve a higher place in the church of God, greater recognition? Don't you think, Lord, that I, that I should be recognized over and above those others? Perhaps someone comes into the kingdom of God and they have these, these giftings and these talents and suddenly they rise to prominence because, because they're sharing the grace of God and people. And you think to yourself, but, but Lord, why? Why does this person come in and they get all this acclaim and this recognition. 
is that just revealing that we're actually we're actually engaging in all of this for for our own ulterior motives for our own earthly recognition for the same basic principles of status and and selfish gain that most people work for their employer i mean you know what i'm saying like do we realize that the gift is not only eternal life but the very presence of god with us here today the joy is in the journey not only in the final arrival point do we not comprehend at times that the same grace shown to us is the same grace that God wants to show to everybody. And why should we be jealous of that? Simply because we feel like we have sacrificed more? Hey, remember that passage in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. It says very plainly that you are not your own, for you were purchased with a price. And then we read in Philippians chapter 3, where it reminds us that we are made rich because he left heaven above and gave up his riches to make us rich. What do we have that hasn't been given to us as a gift? What do we have, especially in the spiritual world, that hasn't, that, that, that hasn't been given to us as a gift of kindness and of grace on behalf of the Master? So then if everything we have is the product of the grace of God, who are we to begrudge? that God would show the same graciousness and the same kindness to somebody else. You know what the quintessential uh, uh, hallmark is? That the grace of Christ has trust, touched our heart, that we are truly citizens of the heavenly kingdom? We are no more obsessed with getting what is our due. You get what I'm saying? We're no longer obsessed with getting what we have earned because we finally Realize it clicks for us. We cannot earn it. It's always only and exclusively by the kindness and the grace of God. And everybody else can have the same kindness and the same grace. So you ask, what motivation is there then? What work incentive is there then for us to labor in the vineyard with the master? Hey, that question in and of itself doesn't make any sense when you understand grace. We labor out of gratitude. We labor and we serve and we sacrifice because that's exactly what He's done for us. He's not asking us to do something He hasn't done for us. He goes ahead. He sets the example. So we follow in His footsteps. He left heaven above. He left His comfort zone. He came into this world to suffer, to bleed, to die for our salvation. So what small request is it in behalf of us that at times we might enter into that suffering? We might also be exhausted and tired and spent for the sake of someone else when that is exactly what he's done for us. You see, the kingdom of God is what they call the upside down kingdom. It doesn't work like this world. It doesn't work like the kingdoms of this world. It works on exactly the opposite principles. It's upside down. It's the gift of grace. And then the knowledge of that grace, the true realization of our helpless estate and what He has done and the extent to which He has gone to redeem us. When that clicks for us, it awakens within us a principle of unselfish gratitude. And that becomes the motivation for our service. No longer working that we may gain, but working because we have nothing to lose. <laughs> we have nothing to, everything that we have has been a gift of God's grace. And so we willingly go out there to seek and to save the lost, to labor in the master's vineyard, to grow it, to establish it, to cultivate it, to make it thrive. Because he has first loved us. We go out and love others. Because he has laid down his life for us, we are willing to lay down our lives for Him and for others. Because He has extended grace to us, we extend grace to others. Because He has come from heaven to proclaim the gospel to us, we go out of our comfort zone to proclaim the gospel to others. We are called, all of us called, to be citizens of this kingdom, to be laborers, co-workers with the King in this glorious vineyard. In the journey is the reward, 
is the presence of God. And one day we will receive the capstone of that, which is our immortality and our eternal life. So again, I'm going to remind you. I'm going to remind you by asking the question, why would you accept Jesus? If you haven't yet, why would you? And if you have, why did you? Is it because you have really seen the goodness and the grace and the character of Jesus and you, and you love that and you love Him for all that He has done? Or is it because He's a means to the end of eternal life? You just don't want to die. You just want to escape the punishment of sin, the consequence of sin, which is death. You see, Jesus will give you the escape from the consequence of sin. But more than that, you and I need to learn to love Him. Because it is in loving Him that there is joy in the journey. It is in loving Him that we no longer become a servant of time and a servant of selfish gain. And we no longer ask the question like the disciples did that led to this very parable. This question here in verse 27 of Matthew 19. Peter answered and said to Jesus, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? What gain is there for us? You see, the disciples, they were a product of their time. They, just like the Pharisees, were obsessed with this idea that you earn, you work to gain. And yes, they were in love with Jesus and they saw something different, but it took them a while to really grasp this. And, and a step in that journey of grasping was this parable that Jesus told of the laborers sent into the vineyard. I ask you today, when you look at your own heart, when you look at your attitude towards others, perhaps that ch share church fellowship with you, or perhaps that regardless of church fellowship, you just perceive to, to, to be the recipients of God's grace in some special way, blessed in some way. Does your heart reveal a certain covetousness, a certain jealousy, a certain cry of, Lord, that's unfair because I have served you all these years. And yet somebody else comes along, a junior in the faith perhaps, and it seems that your blessing attends them maybe in a qualitatively unique way or perhaps in a, in a quantitatively uh, greater way, at least by earthly perception. Is it, is it possible that you, like me at times, can be disoriented with the selfish, meritorious perception of heart that we, it, we make the gifts the idols? of our heart and instead of loving Jesus and being content and being grateful for that experience of friendship with him we, we, we look at these external blessings and we want them we covet them and we begin to grumble against God and wonder why he doesn't treat us in the same way grant us these same gifts you see friend if you like me at times struggle with that you're in good company because the disciples struggled with that. The people of Jesus' time struggled with that. And it was for these strugglers that Jesus told these stories that are so much more than a story. These stories that are about life and about spirituality, about the kingdom of God, and about correcting the aberration of the human heart, reminding us that we are loved by a God of grace. That He has offered to us all the reward of His presence first and foremost and all of us the reward of eternal life and immortality. And we should be content and out of a spirit of gratefulness, not out of a desire to earn our place, but out of gratefulness we are compelled to serve and to love others, to build up the, the vineyard, the kingdom of God on the same basis that we have first been loved. This is the story of this parable. This is what you and I are called to. This is what you and I are invited into. Forget, forget, lay aside, repent of that meritorious outlook upon the kingdom of God. And simply be content and rejoice in the fact that you are loved and you are gifted with the presence of God, with reconciliation with God, with eternal life. And in that gratefulness, hallelujah, we no longer need to be in competition with others. We no longer need to compare ourselves with others. We no, no longer need to put ourselves in the judgment seat, judging even God and whether He is just and fair or not. 
Let it go. Let it go because we have been gifted with the presence of God and eternal life. The joy is in the journey, not only in the final destination. So let me take you back to that experience of myself and my study buddy. Let me remind you of that, that story I started telling you where, you know, the sense in which one person put in so, so much work to get the, essentially the same grades as another person who put in much less work. And let me remind you that at the end of the day, both received the incredible blessing. Because it wasn't so much about how much work went in. It was really about the gift of knowledge and of growing and the experience of being able to bless others through the studies that we were engaging in. So yes, one may have worked harder than the other, but in the end, we both benefited by the grace of the, of the, of the journey itself that resulted in a final outcome of blessing. So let me remind you that when God treats you with kindness, give Him the freedom to treat someone else with the same kindness. When you are a recipient of the grace of God, don't be jealous because God gives someone else that same grace. And I invite you to bow your head with me as we pray about this. Heavenly Father, I ask that you will bless those who are hearing this message right now. Bless us all, Lord, that we would lay aside this selfish ambition that drives us, not only in the temporal world, but also when it comes to spirituality. Forgive us, Lord, where we compare ourselves with others and where we judge you as treating us with less grace or in some, some way unfairly. And may we revel in what is your grace and your generosity. And may you put that same spirit within us, Lord, that as we have received freely, so we would give freely without judgment, without regret, and without comparison. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.